Creative and Sound Blaster are well-known brands among PC gamers. Back in the 1990s, Sound Blaster was the audio card brand. Over the years, this company has released various gaming peripherals, including amps and some headphones. One of those headphones is the Creative Arvana Live, or more lovingly known among audiophile community as the Cal. There is an exclamation mark at the end. Is it necessary? Tell me. <laughs> well, I was just curious why you didn't use an exclamation point. The original Cal is hard to find, it's probably discontinued, but Creative did release the second edition of the Cal, which they very pragmatically call the Creative Arvana Live SE. This is different from the Cal 2. Yes, this is getting a little cumbersome. Anyway, the SE is $50. Why is this series of headphones well regarded among audiophiles and is it all just hype? And by the way, what is this Super XFI amp and how does it relate? Creative calls the SE their quote high definition over ear headphones with Super XFI certification. We'll get into XFI stuff later. Creative says that the SE is comfortable and portable. They claim that the drivers are quote tuned by our acoustic experts and deliver natural and faithful audio akin to live performance. Creative says that the SE uses the exact same drivers as the original Cal. These drivers have biocellulose diaphragms. The SE is supposed to provide clear, detailed treble and deep and rich bass. Creative claims that to get the most out of the SE, you should pair it with one of their XFI amplifiers. Reading between the lines, it appears that Creative is suggesting that the SE has a V-shaped sound signature. But knowing that companies have a bad habit of over-inflating their products, let's keep our minds open about the overall sound signature. What's the first word that comes into mind when I first pick up the SE? Plastic. Lots of plastic. Creaking, shiny, somewhat cheap feeling plastic. But this is a $50 headphone, so let's not be too tough on the construction. While the ear cups, yoke, and vast majority of this headphone are made of plastic, the headband structure itself is metal, and it feels fairly rigid. The ear cups have plenty of movement for a contoured fit. The ear pads are replaceable. The stock ear pads are, well, well, they're stock ear pads for a $50 headphone. I've had worse. These ear pads are made of standard foam padding, however, they are fairly deep. They technically are over ear, but if you have average size ears, it's likely that the top and bottom of your ears will get pinched. The SE has headband padding. It is reasonably thick. The headphones come with a non-detachable cable. It is thin, but thankfully not particularly prone to microphonics. The cable is on the shorter side, about 4 feet. This is clearly intended for mobile use. There are thick, tough cable reliefs built into the ear cups, and those should provide some protection against damage in that area. As for comfort, the SE is a very light headphone. Its clamping force is also on the lighter side. The ear pads, though far from luxurious, are comfortable nonetheless. My ears tend to get a little bit warm after about one hour. I can wear the SE for about two to three hours without any discomfort. Overall, the SE will not blow your expectations out of the water. This headphone looks, feels, and is assembled in a rather, eh, economical way. In other words, it's cheap. But I've had the SE for almost nine months and have yet to see any cracking or wear. If you are reasonably careful with your gear, the SE should last you a while. And while I've worn much more comfortable headphones, I have also worn much more uncomfortable headphones. So the SE is about average, I would say. Except for that light weight. It's one of the lightest headphones I've ever worn. I tested the SE using various sources. This includes the Shit Modi and Liquid Spark stack, the RME ADI2 DAC, and the EcoZerta ITM03. I used the stock ear pads, and obviously the cable is non detachable. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD. The SE is very easy to drive. You don't actually need an amp for this headphone. 
but these drivers tend to get a tighter, harder bass impact when paired with an amplifier, even a modestly powerful one. Creative says that the SE produces deep, rich bass. Surprisingly, the SE sub bass seems close to neutral and the bass overall is fairly clear. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there is a rumbling effect from the beginning of the song. The SE presented this detail. It seemed to be fairly neutral. When I compared it against the Allo Audio S4X, it appeared that the SE was slightly rolled off, but not significantly. When the crescendo hit, the organ cut through the other instruments. There was some melding among all instruments, but nothing sounded muddy or veiled. The rolling thunder effect was clearly audible and did not distort or overwhelm the other elements. When the vocals chimed in, they started at the back until they were about one step ahead of the instruments. In Conquer by Overwork, there's a rolling marble effect at the beginning of the track. It is supposed to pan from right to left to center. The SE presented the rolling marble sound clearly. The panning, however, was barely perceptible. There are multiple drums in this track and the SE recreated all of them clearly. There was marginal melding with each drum strike. Drum impact was hard, but not sharp or piercing. Decay seemed to be about average. I listened to several hip-hop songs including Pure Water, New Patek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each occasion, the SE presented the sub-bass clearly. The subwoofer effect was audible without distortion or bloat. It seemed as if the subwoofer was in a medium-sized room and at the other end. There was some melding between sub-bass and mid-bass, but the drums were clear. The vocals were two steps ahead of the instruments. I tested the SE for sub-bass distortion. I used my Sicario soundtrack playlist. If there is audible distortion, then these tracks will reveal that. The SE never distorted, even at excessive volumes. Overall, the SE seems to provide a close to neutral bass. There is average decay and average melding between sub-bass and mid-bass. This was fairly different from what I was expecting given Creative's marketing. The SE has no audible distortion and provides clean, mostly clear, bass presentation. Creative does not comment about the SE's mids response. My tests indicate that the mids are forward and a bit sibilant. In Orla Gartland's song Why Am I Like This, there is natural vocal grain and sibilance mixed into the track. The SE accentuated both. The grain was a bit more obvious on the SE than on the Allo Audio S4X. The sibilance likewise was a bit more obvious than on the S4X. Compared to the neutral Aventone planar, the difference was obvious. However, neither the vocal grain nor the sibilance was harsh, and it certainly was not to the same degree as that of the HD 560S, which remains one of the most sibilant headphones I've heard. Orla's voice was two steps ahead of the instruments. The drums and guitar were clear and had some melding between their notes. Timbre seemed accurate. In Watch You Back by Haim, the SE again showed that it slightly accentuates sibilance. It was not harsh. At 8 seconds into the track, the primary singer says the word we and drags it out, making a sound gravelly. The SE did present this detail. It was clear and distinct. There are two backup vocalists in the song. The SE presented both of them without any difficulty. When the instruments played at maximum, the backup vocalists remained fairly clear, and upon close attention, I could still hear their separate voices, one in the right and the other in the left ear cups. The drums, guitar, piano, and bass all seemed to have true timbre. There was some melding among notes, but no muddiness. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the SE clearly and accurately presented the ukulele, drums, and bass. The primary male vocalist sibilance was a bit accentuated, similar to how the SE presents female voices. There's a backup vocalist whose voice is layered underneath the primaries. The SE was not able to separate them, which is something a lot of headphones struggle with. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute 20 seconds, there are supposed to be sharp intakes of breaths. The SE perfectly recreated this detail. Overall, the SE presents forward mids. Vocals get a bit of emphasis. Vocal grain and sibilance, if recorded into a track, will get boosted a little, though they should not be sharp or piercing. Clarity in this region is about average, no more and frankly no less than with the Allo Audio S4X. Creative says that the SE will provide clear and detailed highs. My tests indicate that the treble is a little boosted, but not harsh. 
In Skirts Over X-Wings, the SE clearly rendered the brass and horns. They seem to have a bit more energy than on the Allo Audio S4X. The more neutral Aventone Planar had a noticeably different presentation of these instruments. The Timfani was audible, and I could feel a bit of reverberation in the ear cups. Separation of group sets was easily audible. There was depth and width, but no verticality. In other words, some instruments seemed to be closer or further back, but no sounds ever came from above or below. In Flight from the City, the SE made the piano sound like it was 8 feet away. The bassy notes were audible but not distorted or bloated. There was some melding from one note to the next. The cello was fairly smooth and marginally melded with the piano. There are pops and sizzles and electric buzzing effects recorded into the bottom layer of this song. The SE presented these details clearly. I could also hear the creaking of wood on the pianist's bench and the shifting of the cello without any difficulty. In Take 5 by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the SE presented the piano in the right, the drums in the left, the saxophone center, and the bass one step behind. The saxophone appeared to have a little bit more energy than what I heard on the Aventone Planar and the Allo S4X, but this was not harsh. The cymbals seemed to get a bit of a boost as well. The cymbals were almost as loud as the saxophone, sometimes a bit more than the saxophone. The cymbals are hit at different parts, resulting in slightly different sounds. The SE presented this detail as well. There was a bit of melding among all the instruments. I listened to Luigi Baccarini's La Musica Notturna delle Strade di Madrid by the Bremer Baroque Orchestra. Oui. This track was recorded live at a stone cathedral and captures a lot of ambient character. Give it a listen if you get a chance. The idea of listening to this track is to determine if a headphone can present the ambient noises and provide a sense of width. The SE succeeded. All the instruments were crisp and clear. The subtle noises of the stage, the coughing in the audience, the reverberation of the instruments was easily audible. Overall, the SE does have an accentuated treble, and I think that's mostly in the mid to upper treble region. This emphasis is not harsh, nor do I think it is significant. Clearly, there is a deviation away from neutral, but nothing that would make recordings piercing. The SE is able to separate instruments, and there is never a sense of veiled or muffled sounds. The SE is not going to be your headphone for ultimate detail and resolution. Those things are reserved for headphones whose principal job is to analytically present music. The SE does not do that. But the SE does provide obvious details without any trouble. Subtle details are usually clear as well. Compared to typical sub $100 headphones, the SE will likely surprise you. The clarity and separation is a night and day difference when compared to Beats or other fashion accessories masquerading as headphones. Pops and sizzles, electric buzzing, multiple vocalists, creaking of wood, shifting of a cello, sharp intakes of breaths, plucking of guitar strings, all of these details are clear and distinct on the SE. For a more quantitative test, I use the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details, including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, piano, and footsteps. I count the number of footsteps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The Sennheiser HD 800S presents 22 footsteps. The Focal Clear, 18. The Austrian Audio High X 65 presents 16 to 17 footsteps. The Austrian Audio High X 55 presents 16. The Hi-Fi Mansundara, Aventone Planar, and Bear Dynamic DT 1990 present 10 to 11. The Odyssey LCD 2 Closed and LCD 2 Classic each provide 8 footsteps at most. The Monolith M1070 and M 1570 provide 8 to 9 footsteps. And the older M1060C provides 7 footsteps. The Neumann NDH20 provides 5 to 6 footsteps. The Odyssey LCD 1 and HD 6XX present 6 to 7 footsteps. And the Cal SE provides 8 clear footsteps. To better understand where this fits, we need to have a measuring stick. For me, that's the HD 6XX. A lot of people have this headphone and it makes sense to use it as a starting point. The 6XX's performance is my average. Anything above and below is judged accordingly. Consequently, it is obvious that the SE provides at least average detail retrieval and a little bit more. The SE will not blow your socks off with detail, but it does fare quite well against far more expensive headphones. 
The SE soundstage is fairly interesting. You might think that a $50 headphone from a company that does not specialize in headphones would have a narrow soundstage. You would be wrong in regards to the SE. The SE does not have a wide soundstage, at least not on my scale. As with detail retrieval, the 6XX is my starting point. I consider the 6XX as the average soundstage. Let's talk about my scale on how the SE fits in. The Odyssey Mobius and All Beats headphones have claustrophobic soundstage. The NDH20 and ATH-M60X have below average soundstage. The HD6XX and LCD1 have average soundstage. The Hi-Fi Mansundara, Aventone Planar, Austrian Audio Hi-X 55 and 65, and the LCD2 Classic have above average soundstage. The Hi-Fi Mandiva has wide soundstage. The HD800S has super wide soundstage. In my opinion, the SE has about average soundstage. This headphone provides a good separation of instruments, average decay, and at least average clarity. All of this combined results in a close back headphone that provides as much soundstage as the HD6XX. Keep in mind that your original recording, placement of the headphones and ear pads makes a huge difference in soundstage perception. Creative gives the impression that the SE has a V-shaped signature. Well, only in very technical terms. When you think of V-shaped sound, you may think of aggressive V-shaped sound. The one more triple driver, Odyssey LCD XC, and the ZMF Atticus come to my mind immediately. Those headphones have a strong V-shaped signature. The Cal SE, however, has a very lazy V-shaped signature. In other words, there's a boost on the lower and upper ends, but not much. The SE's sub-bass seems close to neutral. Mid-bass seems fairly neutral as well. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say that the sub-bass has a marginal accentuation and there's a slightly greater push in the mid-bass. This emphasis is not that far away from the tuning of the Allo Audio S4X, which is neutral. Decay is about average on the SE. Bass clarity is also about average. Mids are forward. Vocals get a boost in grain and sibilance, though neither is harsh. Vocalists stand out one to two steps ahead of instruments. All instruments appear to have natural timbre. There is some melding among notes, but no muddiness. Treble has an emphasis and probably in the mid to upper treble region. This emphasis seems to be a bit more than what the bass region gets. However, the treble is not piercing. Instruments are clear, though some do get more energy than they would on neutral headphones. Some of this additional energy is transferred to cymbals, which might cause them to sound as loud as principal instruments in a mix. Detail retrieval is easily average and maybe a little bit more. Soundstage is about average. The SE has depth and width, but no verticality. Is this a V-shaped sound? No, I don't think so. At least not when we think of traditional V-shaped signatures. I think this is more of a balanced signature. The fact that vocals and mid-centric instruments are clear is a strong indication that the SE's tuning is not actually bass-heavy or treble-friendly. Some people may call the SE a lively headphone. After all, Creative says live with an exclamation mark. That liveliness comes from the treble emphasis. The SE has enough clarity, separation, detail, and a bit of bass emphasis to make recordings appear, for the lack of a better term, fun, at least to some people. Let me assure you, in the grand scheme of headphones, the SE does nothing revolutionary. Nothing about this sound signature is unique to the SE, except that you get it for $50. That might be the real defining point. It's fairly hard to compare the SE to more expensive headphones. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to compare it to the Denon D5200 or the Odyssey LCD2, but I do want to provide some context to the SE's performance. To that end, I compare the SE to the Sony MDR MA100 and the One More Triple Driver. If you have not watched my MA100 video, then I'm going to cut to the chase. The MA100 is a fantastic bargain. It is cheap, feels cheap, but has excellent instrument separation and placement. I compared each of these headphones using a passive AB switch. I plugged the switch into my Modi Liquid Spark stack and also my RME ADI2 DAC. I tried to volume match. I used stock accessories. 
I listen to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD. The MA100 has a sub-bass roll-off compared to the SE, and the difference is obvious. Transients is a bit faster on the MA100 as well. Separation between sub-bass and mid-bass is slightly greater on the MA100. Mid-bass impact is harder on the SE. Overall bass clarity is greater on the MA100. The MA100 has more neutral mids compared to the SE. The MA100 does not accentuate sibilance. In fact, sibilance appears to be neutral on that headphone. Vocal grain is also neutral on the MA100. Vocals appear a little bit closer to the ears on the SE. The MA100 has marginally more instrument separation. Timbre is the same. Treble on the MA100 is closer to neutral. In fact, I think there's a slight roll-off in the upper treble region on the MA100. Treble is a little clearer and more energetic on the SE. Separation of instruments is greater on the MA100. Placement of instruments, including depth and width, is more noticeable on the MA100. Both headphones have comparable detail retrieval. However, the MA100 has slightly wider soundstage. The One More has slightly less sub-bass presence than the SE. Decay is similar. Separation between sub-bass and mid-bass is more obvious on the SE. Mid-bass impact is harder on the One More. Overall bass clarity is a bit more obvious on the SE. The One More has recess mids compared to the SE. In fact, I would say that the One More's presentation of vocals is actually one step behind instruments. Vocals appear to have a different timbre on the One More compared to the SE. The One More makes vocals appear distant and almost as if the singer is singing through a paper towel roll. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, obviously. Drums are considerably louder than other instruments with the One More. Vocal sibilance is about the same on both headphones. Vocal grain is closer to neutral on the One More. Trouble is more emphasized on the One More. It's not a significant deviation from what the SE does, but it is noticeable in an A-B test. The SE has greater separation of treble instruments and more air. The One More makes instruments appear closer to the ears. The SE has more clarity in the treble region. The One More does not provide width, depth, or verticality. The SE has more detail retrieval and soundstage. These comparisons demonstrate the SE's performance. The SE is, as I've said in the last section, not a V-shaped sound signature, at least not in the traditional sense. These tests also reaffirm that you do not need to look at headphones which cost several hundred dollars to get good performance. If you want instrument placement and detail, the ME100 is a very good option, especially at its cheap price. You do sacrifice some things in return, however. If you want an aggressive V-shaped signature, and one that becomes more aggressive with greater power input, then the One More Triple Driver will deliver. It is among the top three headphones I have heard that provide visceral mid-bass impact, the others being the ZMF Atticus and the Odyssey LCD XC. The SE is like the middle kid. It has more bass than the MA100, but is easier on the ears than the One More. Ultimately, you may find any one of these headphones to your liking, or hate all three of them. Creative has several Super XFI amps that supposedly pair with various headphones. The SE is one of those supported products. The list of supported headphones also includes the EMU Teak, AKG K701, ATH M50X, HE400S, the HD650 and HD800S, and many more. Super XFI is digital processing applied to headphones whose frequency response is in Creative's database. Creative says XFI, when used with certified headphones, accounts and compensates for changes in audio output caused by the headphones to ensure audio reaches your ears as intended. I have no idea what the hell this means. Creative says that the Super XFI profile provides a 3D sound effect and recreates natural realistic audio holography that matches your hearing process to deliver to you a full theatrical experience. You have to use the Super XFI application for Android or iOS. There's also now a desktop application for both Macs and Windows. Much like with Immerse Studio, Super XFI requires you to take photos of your ears and face so that the software can custom tailor the response. First thing is first. I've done this custom tailoring through photos. I purposely took off-angle photos then used some more careful composed photos. I even used a friend's profile that was supposedly tailored to her ears. There is no noticeable difference whatsoever. 
I don't hear a difference one way or another whether the photos were crummy or great, or if the photos were of somebody else's ears. So this part of the software is not particularly convincing. Maybe other people will have different experiences. I purchased Creative's SXFI AMP to test. Oof, that's a mouthful. This is a very well-built mobile AMP DAC. It's made of metal with plastic playback controls. You can control volume and pause or play music. There is also a dedicated Super XFI button. There's a small LED at the top of the Super XFI button as well. Orange indicates that the XFI is off. Green means it is on. There is a singular 3.5mm jack and a USB-C connection. I assure you, this amp has plenty of power for the SE. In fact, while listening to Amazon Music HD, I had to keep the amp's volume on Windows 10 down to 12 out of 100. The desktop and mobile applications are simple and intuitive. You can create multiple accounts using different email addresses. You can switch among your various accounts on the Splash page. Each account can have multiple profiles. There is a 10-band equalizer that you can custom tailor to your needs. You can use one of the presets or create your own. The presets are pretty generic. Flat, classical, pop, game, and cinema. There is an interesting feature in the EQ that allows you to draw your own EQ curve. This is, to be frank, imprecise and likely will frustrate anybody who wants minute changes. But it's there if you want it. The headphone section lets you choose among various headphone profiles Creative has in its database. I originally purchased the Super XFI amp in January of 2021, and back then there were only a handful of profiles. Fast forward 8 months later, the list has grown to triple the original size. Finally, the setup section lets you select the 3D effect. You can leave it as a standard stereo or toggle between 5.1 or 7.1 fake surround. Obviously, this is all digital and no substitute for actual multi-speaker setups. I used the SE with the Super XFI amps many times in the last 8 months. The amp and the software apply changes system-wide when the SE is used with the Super XFI. So, as long as you use the amp as your output, the changes will apply to all audio streams. Frankly, there is an obvious difference with XFI applied. I have tested with numerous other headphones, including those not specifically mentioned as supported. Each and every one has a noticeable alteration in sound, and not always for the better. Switching among the EQ presets also has obvious alterations. With regards to the SE and generally speaking, the XFI software does give a sense of greater soundstage by heavily manipulating the original audio signal. As a result, I have found that mids get recessed by a significant margin. In fact, every frequency is materially affected, resulting in, and this is the ironic part, flatter, less detailed audio. With regard to the 3D effects, yes, they work to a moderate degree. They are as good as any other digital 5.1 and 7.1 implementation. That is to say, not impressive. You can switch headphone profiles to your heart's content. In my test, I switched from the SE's profile to, say, the Apple AirPods Pro profile. There was a noticeable difference. I tried other headphone profiles on the SE and they all had different results from the SE's XFI profile. But what about the Super XFI's amp sound signature without the application. If we set everything to default without using personal profiles, what is the amp's performance? I compared the Super XFI amp to the AudioQuest Dragonfly Red, EcoZerda ITM-03, and the Low 2 Paw S1. I used a passive AB switch. I used Voice Meter Banana to send signal to both DACs at the same time, then merely switch back and forth. I used the SE and the Allo Audio S4 as my test headphones. The short story is this. The SE has a neutral sound signature. The red, by comparison, has a warmer sound. It has more bass emphasis, less clarity, and marginally less detail in the signal. The Zerda and Super XFI amp are very similar. I thought that the Zerda might have slightly less bass than the XFI, but I can't be sure. And in these circumstances, it could just be my imagination. What I am sure about is that the difference between the XFI amp and Zerda is considerably less than the difference between the XFI amp and the Dragonfly Red. 
When I connected using the Paw S1, my findings were consistent as with the Zerta comparison. There were negligible, if any, differences in sound signature. For all intents and purposes, both the Paw S1 and the Super XFI amp are neutral. One does not provide more detail or resolution than the other. By the way, if you want a video about voice meter banana and how to set up and use two DACs from the same PC, leave a comment below. Overall, the Super XFI amp is a powerful, neutral, well-rounded portable amp DAC. There's a lot to it and this thing provides something vastly different from the majority of stuff in the market. For $150, the Super XFI amp gives you a ton of flexibility for EQ. There is no guarantee that you will like the features or the tuning Creative has thrown in with these supported headphones. But you can switch among various profiles add your own EQ settings, and use fake 5.1 and 7.1 surround sound if you wish. The fact that all of this is available both on desktop and mobile is phenomenal. Macs, PCs, Android, and iOS are all supported. Topping, SMSL, Cord, and all the other DAC manufacturers should wake the hell up and take a look at what Creative is doing. Their desktop and mobile applications are exactly what these audiophile companies need to start implementing. In the constant hype for more and more audiophile gear, somebody could go crazy thinking about which headphones, amp, DAC, or IEM to buy. A clown on YouTube could easily convince a new audiophile to buy everything they can. Of course, the idea is that you find what works for you, not what somebody else is pushing for one reason or another. New audiophiles, I think, should be guided through the process. Those of us who have gone through the gamut of hype, used all kinds of gear, and had tumultuous arguments with each other should be more mindful of the new kids on the block. While the experienced veterans are free to lock horns over minutia, I hope we can all agree that those with less experience should not be pushed into buying expensive gear. This is one of my two reasons why I try to find affordable alternatives for people to think about. The second reason is because I know, from years and a lot of wasted money, that expensive gear rarely gives you something sonically unique. The Cal SE and Super XFI amp are two products that make a strong argument for their existence. The SE, while not the sturdiest, most comfortable, most luxurious headphone around, obviously, does everything competently. In fact, a $350 headphone that I recently reviewed distorted all to hell while this $50 plastic product doesn't. Go figure. The SE has a balanced, fairly clear sound signature. It has at least average detail and resolution. It has about average soundstage. The SE has a slight bass emphasis without distortion or muddiness. The mids are forward. There is a marginal emphasis in sibilance and vocal grain. Treble has the greatest amount of push, and even that is in piercing, harsh, or otherwise painful. Compared to typical sub $100 headphones, the SE is an all-round performer. The XFI amp is yet another good product from Creative. When I first purchased the amp back in January of 2021, Creative was still hammering out the application support. Early on, I was somewhat unimpressed. Compared to the alternatives, both below and near the XFI amp's price, I was not convinced that this product had real merit. Months later, through promised updates, Creative has done what it needed to. The XFI amp's global app support is a breath of fresh air. PCs, Macs, Android, iOS, no matter your device, Creative has you covered, eh, other than Ubuntu. And, Unlike some other audiophile applications, Creative's XFI app gives you a lot of flexibility. Not only can you create multiple accounts, but each account can store multiple profiles. And not only can you toggle among several EQ presets, but you can specify your own, both through precise manipulation and by casually drawing on the app. You can get a lot of headphone profiles here too, and they all seem to be tailored differently, though not necessarily accurately you get fake surround sound for better or worse. And best of all, all of these features are fully available on all major platforms. The XFI amp's neutral sound signature, its sturdy build and useful onboard controls makes this portable amp deck something that many might find appealing. This brings us to value. There is no doubt in my mind that both 
the Cal SE and Super XFI amp are value. At $50, I just cannot imagine what I could say negatively that would affect the SE's bottom line. Maybe the ear pads could be more comfortable, but they are replaceable and you can do what you want with them. I really do wish that the cable was detachable, and that's my pet peeve with audiophile headphones such as from Grado. I certainly would have liked less plastic, less creaky build. For $50? Ugh, come on. These are not real complaints, they are nitpicky things. The SE's performance is also nothing to scoff at. If all you have ever heard are Beats or free headphones, yes, I do equate the two, the SE may be an eye-opening experience. If you're used to audiophile headphones, then the SE sound and performance is really not going to knock you back. But the fact that it costs as little as it does just might make your eyebrows shoot up. The XFI amp is something unique. It is different from all the other portable amp DACs in the market. Yes, it has a neutral sound. Yes, it is the typical size and shape. But the software it has is a powerhouse of customization. While I think that the PAW S1 has more useful EQ presets, and the balanced output it has is quite welcome on the S1 as well, the XFI amp has its own specialty. There's no reason why you should not or cannot apply the profile of a headphone different from the one you're using on the XFI amp. And why not? If that other profile appeals to you, then go for it. There's no reason why the 3D effect can't be useful. After all, who else provides that sort of thing? And clearly, the XFI amp has plenty of power for headphones and IEMs, so no need to be particularly concerned about typical headphones. I have no reservations recommending both the Cal SE and the Super XFI amp. While the SE doesn't do anything new, it does provide good performance at a cheap price. And while the XFI amp doesn't have DSD or MQA support, its application ecosystem sets this amp deck apart from the rest. If you're in the market for a daily driver that sounds like the SE, then definitely take a look at the SE. And if you want something as unique as the Super XFI amp, then I think it is worth serious consideration.